Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the book of Proverbs. We are studying this book of Proverbs in the first three months of 2015, January, February, and March. This is lesson number two in that series for January 10, entitled, From Ears to Feet. That's some title. What could that possibly mean? Well, before we jump into it, it's a good thing to have your Bible handy. You're gonna, you may wonder about some of the things we discuss here, so we wanna make sure that you have checked it out for yourself and you, like the noble Bereans, um, make sure we know what we're talking about here. We're not misquoting scripture. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Bow your heads with us, will you? Our kind and loving Father, we have come together today to discuss your will and your word. We look at the book of Proverbs now and try to determine how that wisdom can best benefit us as we try to listen not only to the words of Scripture, but to the pleadings and directions of the Holy Spirit. May everyone here present and those who listen and watch online or via satellite or by some other means may be a benefit is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. So what does it mean from ears to feet? Well you listen and then you get busy. You listen and then you get busy. Well the, the lesson suggests that maybe we should look at Proverbs 4, verses 26 to 27, and I quote, Plan carefully what you do, and whatever you do will turn out right. Avoid evil and walk straight ahead. Don't go one step off of the right way. Is that the way you live your life? I don't know. Well, I made a lot of plans, and they didn't work out very well. Done some what things without planning, too. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> didn't work still, out. I'm looking at the planning part. It didn't work out very well either. What we hear, or more precisely what we pay attention to, comprehend and incorporate into our thinking, determines how we walk the path of life. Our overall paradigm determines how we face life and how we behave. So, now we've used a big word there, paradigm. What, what does paradigm mean? <clears throat> model a model okay our world view how we yeah. view life how we view situation presuppositions perhaps point of view way of looking at okay. things well metaphorically speaking instruction or education informs our paradigm look at Proverbs 4 verse 7 getting wisdom is the most important thing you can do whatever else you get get insight you agree with that? And what would it mean? To, how would you know that you got wisdom? How much wisdom do you need <laughs> before you can? How perfect? Just is enough. Your, how perfect does your wisdom have to be? Uh, the, you only need enough wisdom to make continuously make your right right choices. In other words, if you see a person who's um, not getting in trouble. He's a person with wisdom, right? Well, that ought to be part of it. That ought to be part of it. Who you mix with, who you mm -hmm. rub shoulders with, who you, who you gather your, in quotes, civilized mores from. Mm -hmm. Well, the ancient Egyptians used to picture students as boys with ears on their back. They noted, and I quote, the ear of the boy is on his back. Well, why would they say that? He listens when he's beaten. Is that the way you get people to pay attention to you, especially children? I better not be. I remember these words of wisdom from my grandfather, and of course I never lived with him. He wasn't in charge of me, but he had five sons, five of them, and he used to say that. If you want to get something done, one boy is worth one boy, 
and two boys is worth half a boy, and three boys is no boy at all. <laughs> so I, I think there, he probably had some experience with that. The mischief quotient went up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we certainly hope it doesn't require beatings to get anything done or to learn something wise. But it's not what we're suggesting. It's not just good enough to know what's right and wrong. You must choose what is right. And so we come to Proverbs 4. We'll read part of it at least. Listen to what your father teaches you, my sons. Pay attention and you will have understanding. What I'm teaching you is good, so remember it all. When I was only a little boy, my parents' only son, my father would teach me, he would say, remember what I say and never forget it. By the way, if this is Solomon's writing, was he his father's only son? No. Was he his mother's only son? Maybe. The truth is we don't know for sure. Maybe the time when he was growing up. Remember what I say and never forget it. Do as I tell you and you will live. Get wisdom and insight. Do not forget or ignore what I say. Do not abandon wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will keep you safe. Getting wisdom is the most important thing you can do. Whatever else you get, get insight. Love wisdom and she will make you great. Embrace her and she will bring you honor. She will be your crowning glory. That's quite a... Well, let me read a couple more verses. Listen to me, my son. Take seriously what I'm telling you, and you will live a long life. I have taught you wisdom and the right way to live. Nothing will stand in your way if you walk wisely, and you will not stumble when you run. Always remember what you have learned. Your education is your life. Guard it well. Do not go where evil people go. Do not follow the example of the wicked. Don't do it. Keep away from evil. Re refuse it and go on your way. Wicked people cannot sleep unless they have done something wrong. They lie awake unless they have hurt someone. Wickedness and violence are like food and drink to them. The road the righteous travel is like the sunrise, getting brighter and brighter until daylight has come. The road of the wicked, however, is dark and night as night. They fall but cannot see what they have stumbled over. Pay attention to what I say, my son. Now this is what, the third or fourth time he said that? Listen to my words. Never let them get away from you. Remember them and keep them in your heart. They will give life and health to anyone who understands them. And so forth. I think we better stop there. So, what was, what was and is being applied by these messages? What's the overall theme here? There's a great deal of uh, benefit to yeah. wisdom and, and gaining wisdom. It Paying leads attention. to it leads to um, prosperity, not necessarily, not necessarily in the meaning of uh, financial prosperity, although that is, I believe, is probably a likely end as well. But uh, a full or a more full and a more f satisfied and a more successful life uh, that mm -hmm. you live, and a greater blessing to other people around you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. From where does wisdom come? Can we generate it ourselves, or do we have to get it from something outside of us? Yeah, mistakes. A lot of mis wisdom from mistakes. So you, you, you say we need to go to the University of Hard Knocks? Well, well it does seem to be... Uh, <laughs> in in <laughs> it our does. perspective, it starts with God, and then it's mm -hmm. handed down. You can't learn from history, you're bound to repeat it. Yeah. You know, if you if you make a mistake, and, and you learn from it, and yes, and you became and you become wiser, is is that really a mistake? No, is that is that really the Holy Spirit working in your life? If if you are if you're learning that from the consequences of if you're coming to a realization of of the consequences of your folly. Is that really the Holy Spirit working on your life, or is that just you cogitating uh, what the consequences were? Well, that's one of the, that's what we're trying to ask here. We talk, um, we talk about God's leading, and that's spirit is part of that. Well, young children, where do they get start to get wisdom from their parents, parents right? Yeah. The other question is when. Yeah, and the scary thing is that 
whether we were willing to admit it or not, <laughs> to the best direction that children can look to is their parents. They, they actually look up to their parents as if they were in the place of God. There does seem to be some other effects at play here. There are, there are some children who insist on learning by touching the hot, the hot stove, and there are others who seem to have somehow known not to do that to begin with. And there seems to be some a little more observant than the others. Mm -hmm. You know, they <laughs> observe and they can actually decide not to do something because they saw somebody else do something wrong. Well, you, you, you can't make all the mistakes or you're not going to be around very long. So isn't part of wisdom learning from the mistakes of others? As Jim Wouldn't said, that be a great idea? <laughs> I used to learn from history. Years ago, I worked for a fellow. He had, in the past, had made some, um, as a manufacturer, and made some stuff for a fellow. And the guy says, man, you sure make, make a lot of mistakes. And the fellow says, yeah, but we learned by him. And the other guy says, but do you have time to make them all? Yeah. I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> but personality comes into this. I mean, all of us that have had kids, you can see pretty well from infancy the differences. Mm -hmm. And some of it is, some of them are quicker to show it than others. It's, it's the variation is tremendous. Well, but de despite your, your, your inclination, you still learn, you still, oh, yeah. you still grow from your, from your experiences. Unfortunately, as we grow older, and it seems especially as we pass through the teenage years, we discover that people hear what they want to hear. And unfortunately, it is often only from their peers, who may not be any wiser than they are. A good aphorism is peers are parasites. <laughs> <laughs> and peers want to hold you back. And uh, what, What's implied by those words? Why is it so difficult to comprehend and seriously think about ideas that do not fit with what we want to hear? Let me, let, me read, let me read that again. Why is it so difficult to comprehend and seriously think about ideas that do not fit with what we want to hear? Can, I, can you think of a, a biblical example? Twelve disciples, three times. Okay. Twelve disciples, let me give an example. Twelve spies came back from the land of Canaan. And 10 said, there's no way we... Can. Now, did the children of Israel want to go up there and possess the land? Yes. They did. They said, we're on the border here. We're ready to go. 12 of them said, I mean, 10 of them, the, the spies said, Let, you know, we can't do this. They're big. They're giants. They're, the land is terrible. Da, 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 da. And two said, we can do this. God will be with us. We can conquer the land. And what did they decide? Majority rules. Yeah. Very sad in that case. You know, there's, there's some cases, and I've seen it all over the place, that people have their ideas kind of stacked up in a nice stack. They find out something in the stack in the bottom needs to be changed, but they have to take all their stack down and restack it again. And so they won't want to take, it's really hard for them to change that thing because they would have to redo their stack. Can you, can you think of any biblical examples of that? Um, what about Paul on the Damascus Road? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He had three years to complete fruit basket upset. He had to rethink. He probably had memorized the Old Testament in Hebrew. Prob very likely. He was a bright scholar. Very likely he had memorized the entire Old Testament. He had to go back and think through that whole thing. He didn't have to throw out any of the stories that he learned and read. He just had to remodel them. Yep. Well, that's interesting that, that you, could, you could actually memorize the Bible and still get it wrong mm -hmm. and still have to go and work things out again. And, what, do you, and what do you think about the rest names? of the Pharisees? Didn't they have the same problem? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. You can't re read the Bible, study the Bible, translate from one language to another without having a point of view. You have a paradigm. And it's comfortable there. And to make a paradigm shift, it takes some effort. 
to move from one point of the table to the other. I have to get up. My heart has to uh, exercise and, and for me to get over there. And I take another look and I see there's others, other things to look at. But that's work and people are basically lazy. Yeah. And, and sometimes it can be painful. Yeah. Mm. Well, Matthew tells us, Matthew 13, 44, of course, this is Jesus talking. He, of course, was speaking in Aramaic, and we have it in Greek. The king, we have it in English translated from Greek, so you see we're <coughs> two or three languages away. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man happens to find a treasure hidden in a field. He covers it up again and is so happy that he goes and sells everything he has. And what did people say? What is this foolish guy doing, right? Selling everything he has? What does he do? He goes back and he buys the field, and now the treasure is his. Right? Is that, is that honest? <laughs> well, it's very, it's very likely that what happened in this case is that uh, someone previously, who had a lot of money, buried it there, and then that person died, and that person probably had been gone for a long time. So it didn't really belong to the person who was a current owner of the field either. How about their family? Well, you, we, of course, we don't know that. Been, nowadays, you'd have to put it in a museum at the diction of the government somewhere. Probably. That's an encouragement to re do some research rather than just jump to a conclusion or, or to mm -hmm. do nothing. Well, Jeremiah 29, verse 13 says, You will seek me, and you will find me, because you will seek me with all your heart. What does that mean? What it says. <laughs> So how do we form our paradigm? Do we, do we gather ideas from here and there and there and there and eventually we build up our stack as Gary talks about? We're comfortable with our, perhaps our, our life experience. We're comfortable perhaps with our friends and our position and standing and to want to move and take another look at the, the data is all out there. It's just mm -hmm. that you have, maybe have to remodel it, you have to incorporate some stuff, maybe you have to tweak it, and that's hard work, that's work. Is it, is, it, is it easier to accept some new ideas than it is to accept others? Oh, sure. Is it, why? Because that's some work. don't have to, you don't have to unstack so many things on some things. Yeah. The less you have to change your paradigm to accept the new idea, the easier it is, right? Well, take, take an, a, a, a teaching, a, a comfortable teaching in, in uh, most religion. Somehow, the right blood was, was, came about. Jesus paid the penalty for your sins. It's, people are comfortable with that. I'm not, but it took some study and, and life experience and observation and testing to realize that God is not a, uh, honored with paganism. Mm -hmm. You know, isn't, isn't humility kind of... Um kind of a way to keep things pliable. So even though you stack up this big stack that you're willing to undo it again if something shows that you need to, un yeah. to undo it. Uh, I don't see too, yeah, I know, but I don't see too many people with that kind of humility. The herd mentality. Can you think of someone in the Bible? Let's think of examples. Who, who in the Bible said, we're going to go check that out? Check it out. Mm-hmm. What about? Probably the most famous story is the two spies who went into yeah. the land of Canaan to kind of check things out. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came back with, uh, on what, with some remarkable stories. And uh, of course, when you number two, Israel. Well, two, two, two spies, but there were two of the spies who came back with some positive stories. Yeah. But well. My, what I was thinking about is something in the New Testament in Acts 11. Do you remember about the Bereans? What was famous about the Bereans? Study. Yeah. Yeah. Sell books. Paul says he went there and he spoke, spoke the gospel to them and they said, okay, fine, that's good, but we want to see it in the Bible. We want to see it in the scrolls. Bring out the scrolls. Let's study it for ourselves. We're not going to accept this unless we see the evidence ourselves. Be clear back in Exodus 6 starting at verse 6, and the, God is t uh, telling the children of Israel, he'll take them out of the land of bondage into the land which he promised to give them for, uh, with his, their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, mm -hmm. and Jacob. But it goes on, 
It says, I'll take you out with a strong arm and all the promises. But anyway, it says, Moses spoke thus to the people, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and cruel bondage. They were com more comfortable living in the uh, situation that they had rather than following God's promise and, and instruction. One of the questions that our lesson asked this week is a, is a challenging one. What role does em do emotions play in learning, teaching? Very much. What role? What, how, how, do they, how do they fit in here? What, many times emotions are illogical. I was going to say you can't fully trust emotions, but it obviously has an effect on various vicissitudes of life and changes. Think, of, think about different ways in which people have worshipped God down through the generations. Mm. Some of them are very emotional. Yeah. Some are not. Um, do emotions tend to lead us in the right direction? Or they sometimes lead us in the wrong direction? It can be either way. Off in the wrong direction. I was going to say, look at the difference in a church service and a big uh, rock and roll concert out here in Calexico. Mm -hmm. well, people go mad rapidly in crowds, but return to their senses slowly, yeah. one by one. Yeah. You know, we are a bundle of emotions. There's no doubt about it. When when you have to be careful. When Jesus saw that the that woman put the two coins in the mm -hmm. the the coffer. He responded emotionally to that, too. Yeah. Well, one of the goals that is set before us is a thing called doing right because it is right. What role do emotions play in that? And let me take a really pointed example. What role did emotions play in the thinking of Jesus on Crucifixion Weekend? He couldn't trust his emotions. He had to go on the solid evidences and solid teaching and learning that he had prior to that. Well, I, I don't know about that. I mean, don't you think that think he loved he us so much that he he went through the whole thing? Yeah, That's that kind of an emotion. Yes, it was emotion, but that was, it wasn't the drive. It was uh, the logic involved. You don't think it wasn't the drive? Love isn't the drive? Well, love, is a, love? love isn't a, really an emotion. Lo it love isn't? is a principle. <laughs> no, no, well, it's the, emotion yeah, the, too. The, the agape love is a principle. Now, there's other kind of God, love. Well, if that was true, I could program a computer to do it, and they can't do that. It has to go by logic mm. completely. Well, suppose that I say, okay, I have been baptized as a Christian. I am now going to walk straight down the path that God wants me to walk in. What obstacles are my, am I likely to meet if that, I try to do that? You remember what it says in 1 Peter 8, 5, verse 8? Be alert. Be on, what? on the watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, if we're just slouching along, lazing along, doing what's comfortable, what's easy, along with the rest of the world, does the devil have to worry about us very much? We're just, we're taking care of ourselves on his behalf, right? But what happens if we decide to jump out of line and go God's way instead of the Satan's way? Then what does the devil have to do? Goes to work. Turn up the heat. He's got to go to work. He's got to figure out how to try to get us back on his side if possible. I mean, if enough people take the gospel seriously, it's curtains for him, right? I mean, this is a life and death matter for him. Well, look at Proverbs 5. Pay attention, my son, and listen to my wisdom and insight. Then you will know how to behave properly and your words will show that you have knowledge. The lips of another man's wife may be as sweet as honey and her kisses as smooth as olive oil, but when it's all over, she leaves you nothing but bitterness and pain. Think Solomon had any, any personal experience. You know, I'm, I'm, looking at, <laughs> I'm looking at these leading chapters, the, 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 the headings for the different 
sections here, and as we discussed primarily last week and a little bit this, and the first about four chapters basically are kind of leading us into these proverbs, talking about wisdom. They talk about the benefits of wisdom mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. And now we're ready to head into the meat of the thing mm -hmm. and start hitting these proverbs and all this wisdom. And all of a sudden, he's, he's wham, instead of honesty and being kind to your children, he's talking about a doctor here already. Mm -hmm. Well, let's listen to that, and let's see what we, if we can conclude what he's really talking about. She, this, this adulterous woman, this harlot, this prostitute, she will take you down to the world of the dead, and the road she walks is the road to death. She does not stay on the road to life, but wanders off and does not realize what is happening. Now listen to me, my sons, and never forget what I'm saying. Keep away from such a woman. Don't even go near her door. If you do, others will gain the respect that you once had, and you will die young at the hands of merciless people. Yes, strangers will take all your wealth, and what you have worked for will belong to someone else. You will lie, groaning on your deathbed, your flesh and muscles being eaten away, and you will say, Why would I never learn? Why would I never let anyone correct me? I wouldn't listen to my teachers, I paid no attention to them, and suddenly I found myself publicly disgraced. Be faithful to your wife and give your love to her alone. Children that you have by another woman will do you no good. Your children should grow up to help you, not strangers. So be happy with your wife and find your joy with the woman you, are mar you married. Pretty and graceful as a deer, let her charms keep you happy and let her surround you with her love. Why should you give your love to another woman, my son? Why should you prefer the charms of another man's wife? The Lord sees everything you do. Whatever, wherever you go, he's watching. The sins of the wicked are a trap. They get caught in the net of their own sin. They die because they have no self-control. Their utter stupidity will send them to their graves. Is that the way it happens? Is this kind of a proverb in its own way? Is this, um, I mean, it reads as if it's literal, and it's good advice for literal. Mm -hmm. But also, are, are we also addressing uh, spiritual application well, here as well? What one be, wanders from one spiritual roots or wherever he roots is wrong. Well, in this ch chapter, a superficial reading of the proverb might suggest that it's warning against associate with, association with prostitutes. And that would be a valid, as you just pointed out, would be a, a valid thing to say. But there's also a biblical yeah. application. You certainly get over to Revelation, and yeah. there's an application here of... A broader look at Scripture right. shows that an immoral woman represents spiritual apostasy, particularly among God's chosen people. And there's a lot of verses. Isaiah 57, this is just a, a hand, I just a picked out a few. Isaiah 57, verse 3, Jeremiah 3, 2-9, 13, 27. Ezekiel 16, the whole chapter. Ezekiel 23, the whole chapter. Ezekiel 43, 7 to 9. Hosea 1 to 4. 5 verse 3. 6 verse 10. Nahum 3 verse 4. Revelation 17 verse 1. Verses 15 to 16. And then finally Revelation 19 verse 2. And that's just a few places where the Bible likens a, a perverse woman to spiritual adultery. When one... When one takes up with a false god, one is entering into an adulterous relationship with the true God. What do you mean by an adulterous relationship? I don't know. That's a strange word to me. I don't understand that too well, much it, about adultery. It all has to do with knowing, like Adam okay. knew his wife. Um, so it's, it goes that direction somehow. Okay. Um, do you remember what it says in James 1, verses 15, or 13 to 15? If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say this temptation comes from God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. Now we're talking about where temptation comes from, right? But people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. Then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, 
gives birth to death. He doesn't beat around the bush too much, does he? So very often our own thoughts and ideas lead us away, lead us astray. The best safety comes in Bible study and prayer and focusing particularly on following the example of Jesus. And there's a third leg in that stool of Bible study and prayer. The third one is witnessing. Why is witnessing such an important part of the Christian, li Christian life? We had a whole series, a whole Sabbath school series on that not too long ago. Well, it has a tendency to focus on what you've been taught and believe. Yeah. In order to teach someone else something, you have to understand it a lot better than you did before you right. were able to teach them. <laughs> yes. Very important point. Yes. Well, but there's a saying in education, if you want to learn something, then go teach it. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's exactly what we're talking about. Well, we also need to remember that an idle brain is a devil's workshop. And I wondered how far back that goes. The, first pl the oldest place we can find it quoted is in H.G. Bone, B-O-H-N, in a, title, a book entitled uh, The Handbook of Proverbs, written in 1855. We need to keep our minds occupied with important tasks that God has given us in preparation for the final days. Ellen White recommended that we should even keep a small Bible with us so that when we are waiting in, at a bus stop or in a traffic or at a shop or in line somewhere, we can memorize Scripture. I mean, unfortunately, it sometimes seems like the art of memorizing the, uh, a portion of, even a portion of Scripture has become a lost art. And so here's what Ellen White says. Oh, I'm sorry, this is what our Bible study guide says about that. Perhaps the best protection of all against the temptation to love another woman or man is this. Just love your own spouse, the wife or husband of your youth. Proverbs 5, verse 18. The author of Ecclesiastes resonated with this counsel. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the, um, under the sun. Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. What if you don't love them? You know, well, that's Paul, a problem. Paul said, I mean, some of the, some of the, 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 the directions and, and counsel Paul gives to, to men in, in the New Testament passages, a couple of three books, is men love your wives. Mm -hmm. And he tells the women to do certain things. He tells, what, you know, what if you don't, how do you tell somebody to love somebody else? How do you? How do you? A lot of ways. How do you? How do you do that? How do you? How do you decide? Well, I'm going to love this person. I, she was picked out for me, or it would be the case maybe in Paul's day. How do you? Mm -hmm. How do you go love somebody you don't love? That's a good question. Well, you could. Yeah. You could all. You could say instead of love, you could say value. Yeah. Value your wife. If you talk to people from the east. Places in, like India, for example, where often parents choose a partner for their children. They will say, you know, the difference between us in the East and you in the West is you take a red-hot pot and you put it on a cold stove and it cools down. We take a cold pot and put it on a hot stove and it gets warm. Statistically, it seems to work. It worked quite well. Well, what they're saying basically is your parents might be a better judge of who's the right person for you to marry than you are. Well, what about this? Do you agree with these words? Every test that you've experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps His promise and He will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the time you're about, you are put to the test, He will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. Does that always work in your experience? Read that again. What was that? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, the last part. At the time you are put to the test, He will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. 
I, I think it works when it counts. Now, does that mean that you'll have the strength to endure it, and then you're going to, uh, and then there's you're not going to be in there forever. You're going to find your way out, or does that mean he's giving you a choice? You can stay here and learn your lessons, or you can run. <laughs> maybe well, you can some, escape. Maybe sometimes that's the right thing to do. <laughs> well, it could be that um, um, when you're in temptation, there there's a fence around you, you know, and you can't get out. But um, the Lord will open the fence. Uh, you still have to make the decision to run, but the fence is now open. That's kind of how I see it. Well, there's another slightly different variation on all this found in Proverbs 6, the first few verses. Let's read that. Proverbs 6. Have you promised to be responsible for someone else's debts, my son? Have you been caught by your own words, trapped by your own promises? Well then, my son, you're in that man's power. But this is how you get out of it. Hurry to him. Beg him to release you. Don't let yourself go to sleep or even stop to rest. Get out of the trap like a bird or a deer escaping from a hunter. What do we make of that? Well, did they remind, these words remind you of the, the proverb, this old English proverb, with friends like these, who needs enemies? <laughs> or maybe the, the words of Voltaire who said, Lord, protect me from my friends. I can take care of my enemies. What does it say? Never a borrower or a lender be. Mm -hmm. I'll be a borrower or a lender. <laughs> well, in Hebrew, the word friend also means neighbor. That is, someone who's close to us. The closer we get to others, the more vulnerable we make ourselves to, uh, to them. Human relationships are the most important in our lives. I mean, I don't think any of us would argue with that. But sometimes also the most dangerous and the most disturbing. How many of us have prayed for a good friend? How many friendships have been destroyed by financial dealings gone bad? As suggested by that, those first five verses of Proverbs 6. But now, I think we would be amiss if we don't turn to the spiritual realm. If someone tries to explain to us a new truth, are we like the noble Bereans investigating to see if it's really true? What do we do when we hear about a new truth? Adventists used to have a magazine called Present Truth. What is that? Well, what do you mean by new truth? As I asked, Does that's what I asked the you. the old truth is wrong? No, it doesn't have to mean that. Doesn't have to it mean could that. mean that in some situations, but or it may just mean that you want to add some more truth to what your paradigm you know, that you have already. I remember my dad. I was really young. I, this was some of the first things I ever remembered. When my dad was mowing the lawn, he got down to the last strip and he ran out of gas. Man, he just he just blew up. Man, I, you know, just a, one more strip and he could have done it. And my brother went to him and he says, well, why don't you just put water in the gas tank? It'll work. I mean, and start it up. And Dad, Dad said, water doesn't burn. I mean, it's just a simple thing, but my brother couldn't get an engineering degree from that. You know, so you're going you're gonna to learn more truth about how engines run as you get older. And the same thing with, with spiritual things. You're going to learn more things about that. Well, Proverbs tells us that we, we mustn't be co-signers on a loan, right? How does that fit with Exodus 22, verse 25? If you lend money to any of my people who are poor, do not act like a money lender and require him to pay interest. Well, just, How many people would be happy to borrow money from you without paying it so that they didn't have to pay interest for it? Ezekiel 18 says if you lend it interest, you're going to die. Wow. <laughs> Seriously, it's right there. Exodus 23, verses 2 and 3. Do not follow the majority when they do wrong or when they give evidence that perverts justice. Do not show partiality to a poor person at his trial. Partiality to... Mm -hmm. In other words, stick with the truth. Mm -hmm. Believing a lie is a deadly trap. 
How do you fit Exodus 22? Well, we just read that. And 23, 2 and 3. How do you fit that with the Proverbs 6 passage? And compare Proverbs 22, verse 27. If you should be unable to pay, they will take you away even your bed. Well, the, the Exodus verse doesn't say you should loan money. Mm -hmm. This is my paraphrase. If okay. you're stupid enough to loan money, <laughs> you're in trouble. Then, already. you know, then you need to live up to the obligations that go, these obligations that we're outlining here. So you're saying, are you suggesting the smartest thing is not to get involved with the loaning of money? See, here, it seemed to suggest not that you loan them the money, but you co signed. Right, well, it's a. We're teaching them to be somebody to be irresponsible. Parents mm -hmm. co sign for cars or something for their children. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, many times it's, it's irresponsible. Yeah. And if you loan money to a friend and the friend doesn't repay it, now you lost a friend and you lost, you're out the money. Mm -hmm. So you might as well figure it it's like a gift. Yeah. It's a, otherwise you'll harbor it, some wrong. If, you know, a, a child is one thing. Mm -hmm. But if you're having to co-sign for somebody, that, in a way, that could indicate that they do not have the, the wherewithal, the resources, or whatever, to be, be handling this loan in the first place. Right. Very likely. Then why would you even co-sign in the first place? Well, that's exactly. Emotion. Yeah. That's, what it's, that's what it's saying here. Uh, you must like the person, or, or he's done something to to make you. I can him. tell you. I can tell you <laughs> from personal experience. I lost a lot of money one time, because we basically sort of co-signed a loan for a family member of a very close friend of ours. The very close friend of ours, we didn't consult with them, which we should have, because they told us later. Oh, you should never have loaned any money to this guy or had anything to do with him. <laughs> and we lost a lot of money on it. But we assumed that he was as reliable as his relatives, which he obviously wasn't. <laughs> well, but weren't you fulfilling with someone in need? You were fulfilling no, your Christian Somebody duty. in want. Yeah, he wasn't really in need. <laughs> you would have been yeah, better off just want, to give it to him. Somebody in want, not need. Huh? <laughs> well, Nothing motivates like fear and greed. I've never quite heard that word used that way before <laughs> in that context. <laughs> well, the next section in our study, Proverbs 6, starting with verse 6, lazy people should learn a lesson from the way ants live. They have no leader, chief, or ruler, but they store up their food during the summer getting ready for winter. How long is the lazy man going to lie in bed? When is he ever going to get up? I'll just take a short nap, he says. I'll fold my hands and rest a while. But while he sleeps, poverty will attack him like an armed robber. I like the way the RSV says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a vagabond oh and want like an, un, uh, like an armed man. That was my... Saturday and Sunday afternoon naps. <laughs> That's your lay activities on Sabbath. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, what, what should we learn from ants? Well, they move many times more than their own weight. That's one thing. They, Are they? they, they very industrious. They overwork. I see. They're workaholics. Right, yeah. They never... They never stop for very long? That's right. Never go into a house you're not supposed to be so in. There's something wrong with those ants. <laughs> well, how many human beings do you know that actually do that kind of work? I don't know. Do ants ever rest? I haven't studied ants. ants a slumbering ant? Yeah. They certainly seem to be very active early in the morning when I'm out running. Oh, you never see see ants that aren't moving around or yeah, carrying do. or hauling or... It's a bit on the time of the year. Yeah. I can tell you some of the big ants out in East Africa, they would sit still. Or unless they were disturbed. Oh boy. <laughs> Shoot. Yes. Then they would go to business. I, uh, I don't know how much I should tell you, but we, we, um, we lived at a, 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 a burgeoning campus. We were there at the very beginning of this campus. It's now a university out in Africa. And we, one time there was a, a pastor invited from England to come and, and speak to the, to the young pastors that were, being, that were being trained there. 
And um, so he was staying with us, and he had just given a nice Sabbath sermon, and he came down, and a bunch of the young men were, were came, came with him, and they were standing in our front yard, and what he didn't realize, he was standing on an ant, top of an ant, uh, mm. ant nest. <laughs> and I don't know what it is about those ants in Africa, but they have some way of signaling. And, <laughs> oh, yes. and you get a bunch of them, you don't even know there's anything going and on, and all of a sudden they signal and they all bite at the same time. <laughs> oh, the ants that come in your house sometimes, and you'll, you'll maybe get one, yeah. and the, all the others start yeah. scurrying. Yeah. They're just nailing one. Yeah. Yep. Oh, there's, there's I don't know how that works. Something. But uh, I tell you, this guy stripped his pants down right in the middle. <laughs> he didn't. Poor guy. We felt sorry for him. He was picking ants off. Not a, not a very, um, let's see, um, what shall I say? This type of ants usually have sentries. Ideal way to. Ideal way to see. And boy, the word gets around yeah. quick. Yeah. Well, do we live our lives every day in light of the entire great controversy? Ants, ants prepare for the future, right? They prepare for winter, right? So what's our horizon that we have an opportunity to live? Isn't our horizon from the beginning of the Great Controversy <coughs> to the end of it? Yes. Do we act in, in that context? Well, Ellen White says in a little book, the little book Education, page 145, paragraph 2, this is a question that demands consideration by every parent, every teacher, every student, by every human being, young or old. No scheme or business or plan of life can be sound or complete that embraces only the brief years of this present life and makes no provision for the unending future. It's quite a statement, huh? Do we guide our thinking in our Bible study every day based on a correct understanding of the issues in the Great Controversy? If we do not, we will not be able to fully appreciate what we are learning. The Great Controversy is the overarching reality for all existence. Now, a lot of people won't understand that statement, but I think we do, and I hope all you out there do. Look at Proverbs 6, verses 9 to 11 now. How long is the lazy man going to lie in bed? When is he ever going to get up? I'll just take a short nap, he says. I'll fold my hands and rest a while, but while he slumbers, poverty will attack him like an armed robber. Of course, that's the last part of the passage we already read. What, le what lessons are we supposed to learn from that? <laughs> the, hard obvious, the obvious hard ones. ones. Hard ones. <laughs> Hard ones, yeah. Well, Paul had something to say about that. Do you remember First Thessalonians? I'm second. Sorry, Second Thessalonians three, verse ten. Whoever refuses to, refuses to work is not allowed to eat. Bang. Should we should we follow that advice? Next time you drive by the guy standing out there on the corner asking for for some dollars. It's hot out there. He's working. He's working. Okay. <laughs> raining out there. <laughs> it points out, I think overall, if we're, if we're physically able to look after ourselves, that's what's expected. There's always injured people and people with deformities, that's a different thing. But what we see these days, people expect it. Mm -hmm. Me work? No. Go down, <laughs> go down and get it off the government. Well, times have changed. Yeah. While the Bible commends those who work diligently to prepare for the future, it does not suggest that we should do that 24-7. What provision does the Bible make? The day of rest. Sabbath. The Sabbath is God's planned day of rest. We need to take advantage of it every week. Well, moving on to the last section of our lesson in the last few minutes we have, Proverbs 6, we'll first we'll look at briefly at verses 12 to 15, then we'll look at 16 to 19. Worthless, wicked people go around telling lies. They wink and make gestures to deceive you, all the while planning evil in their perverted minds, stirring up trouble everywhere. Because of this disaster, because of this, disaster will strike them without warning, and they will be fatally wounded. And one of the more traditional translations has that a little differently. Look at the King James. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, 
He's, he teaches with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief and continually he soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Doesn't sound like something we ought to be doing, does it? It's a bit like politics here and there. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, Ellen White says these very challenging words. You should control your thoughts. This will not be an easy task. Of course, she was talking to a specific young person. You cannot accomplish it without close and even severe effort. Yet God requires this of you. It is a duty resting upon every accountable being. You are responsible to God for your thoughts. If you indulge in vain imaginations, permitting your mind to dwell upon impure subjects, you are in a degree as guilty before God as if your thoughts were carried into action. All that prevents the action is the lack of opportunity. Day and night dreaming and castle building are bad and exceedingly dangerous habits. When once established, it is next to impossible to break up such habits and direct the thoughts to pure, holy, elevated themes. You will have to become a faithful sentinel over your eyes, ears, and all your senses if you would control your mind and prevent vain and corrupt thoughts from staining your soul. The power of grace alone can accomplish this most desirable work. You are weak in this direction, speaking to that particular person. And that was Second Test Volume 2 of the Testimonies, page 561, paragraph 1. That's a pretty solemn... Grace going to help with that. Yeah. Well, what do you think? So if we're guilty before God as if our thoughts were carried into action, does the reverse of that work? If our good thoughts aren't carried into action, we're given credit for it? <laughs> That's a that's a good one. I like one. that. I think that's what it's teaching. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think don't you're think right. it is, but <laughs> I think you're right. It's like a lawyer. <laughs> well, look at this last section. There are several things that the Lord hates and cannot tolerate: a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that kill innocent people, a mind that thinks up wicked plans, feet that hurry off to do evil a witness who tells one lie after another, and someone who stirs up trouble among friends. That's like politicians. Now, you don't have to speak as if you had some experience here now. And you got to be careful when you read that because it sounds like he might be talking about people, but he's talking about things, things that God doesn't like. Mm. Well... No, it's it's actually innocent it's, blood. It's, to me, it's, that's the likes of ISIS and their pals. That's what that's talking about. You know, I, this sounds odd, but I knew I once knew somebody who accused somebody of being like that. And in my view, and I think the view of many others, the the person accusing was actually the one who was really like that. Mm -hmm. Well, he did those things. Must have did well, them. the sad part about lying, since we there's two or three lines there that mention it, the sad part about lying is if you lie often enough, you come to believe your lies are the truth. Satan, I'm sure, as intelligent as he was at one time, believes his lies. What happens in your brain when you come to believe a lie? It yeah, makes difficult it difficult to tell the truth. That becomes your paradigm, doesn't it? Yep. Not? Yeah. Yeah. And often we find that we tell one lie, then we have to tell another lie to cover up that lie because someone says, well, why did you do that? Well, I had to do this. And then there's another lie to cover that one, and pretty soon you're building a whole castle. That what would make you think that he believes his own lies? The devil? Yeah. He's still trying to attack the new Jerusalem when it comes down at the third coming. He says, we can, we can well, conquer this city. Well, how do you know that th that's answering that question? <laughs> <laughs> it gets into the region of mental illness, mm -hmm. paranoid delusions. Mm -hmm. It all starts out somewhere on a false premise, and it's the same with the devil. Well, 
as we are we searching the Bible on a daily basis to better understand and know the truth? Ellen White has some very potent things to say about that. The student of the Bible should be taught to approach it in the spirit of a learner. We are to search its pages not for proof to sustain our opinions. Has any of you ever seen anybody do that? But in order to know what God says, Education 189, paragraph 1. One of the chief causes of mental inefficiency, Carrie, and moral weakness is the lack of concentration. With the immense tide of printed matter, think about television and radio now, with the immense tide of printed matter constantly pouring from the press, old and young form the habit of reading hastily and superficially. Have you ever heard of a soundbite? And the mind loses its power of connected and vigorous thought. Same book, Education, page 189, paragraph 5. The habitations that the ants build for themselves show skill and perseverance. Only one little grain at a time can they handle, but by diligence and perseverance they accomplish wonders. Solomon points to the industry of the ant as a reproach to those who waste their hours in idleness or in practices that corrupt soul and body. I can't tell you how often. I think with my schedule, I've got, I mean, like, it seems like every minute of the day and night's full of something I got to do, and sometimes I'm behind, and oh man, and then people come into my office, what do you do all day? <laughs> oh, I, 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 well, I watch television. Yeah. Think, Little earphones. Man, if, if there were just for a way to me that I could put these people to work. Is, now, is that the big message that Solomon is, uh, is pointing out when he's using ants as an example yeah. is that um, you don't have to accomplish things by accomplish great big things. It's it's little 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 things, and if you just keep after that, and eventually you've got some you've got a big thing. Yeah, it's the parable of the talents. In well, in the, in the amount of the light of the amount of few seconds we have left. In light of the wisdom suggested by our study this week, how often do we put ourselves out to help others? Isn't that what Jesus did? Remember, greater love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Well, some of Solomon's Proverbs are quite similar to those of other ancient sages from other lands. Is that a case of plagiarism by Solomon? You can discuss that. Why did the Israelites so often go astray when they had this wisdom that had been given to them thousand years ago by their recognized leaders. And now 2,000 years later, we're still not in the kingdom. What has gone wrong? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this privilege of opening your word and discussing it for the benefit of others. May your Holy Spirit go with our words and bless them and lead those who hear them to think carefully about what's been said is our prayer in Jesus' name.